Good morning, church. So good to be here today. Let's sing together. Let's stand and praise the name of Jesus. Oh, 
let's give him all our praise this morning for he is good amen, amen. water you turn into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no
You guys are free and welcome to come to the front and worship here in the front. We're praising His name. We're praising His name. So if you, if you feel comfortable, you can come to the front and worship the name of Jesus. This is why we are here, to worship the name of Jesus and to praise Him, the only one worthy, the only one worthy of our praise. Thank you, Jesus.
God's presence this morning. But I do turn and greet three or four people and turn your attention to this name. Hey everyone. We're so glad you're joining us. Whether you're with us online or in person, here's a few things you need to know. There are a lot of great things happening at Harvest Time. Here's a few ways you can get involved right now. To check out all things that are happening at Harvest Time, scan the QR code or visit us at htchurch.com. If you'd like to give, you can visit htchurch.com, click on Give at the top of the page. Use our Realm Connect app to set up recurring giving, or you can give anytime using the Harvest Time offering envelopes. We have so many opportunities to believe, belong, and be light. For more information on all things Harvest Time, meet us at the Connect Desk. We love you, Harvest Time, and have an awesome week. Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to Harvest Time. We're so glad that you came to worship the Lord with us this morning. Isn't it great to be in the Lord's presence? Amen. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. Amen. Thank you so much, worship team, for leading us before the feet of Jesus today. And uh, we also want to say good morning to everybody who's worshiping with us online today. We bless you. If you're watching us on YouTube, we're glad that we're one family together in Jesus. I want to remind you that at 9 o'clock, we have ministry for all of our kids up through the age of 4. And at 1030 in this service, there's ministry for kids up through the 5th grade. And we also have nursery care always in all of our services for your infants and your toddlers. Life groups for uh, students in middle school and high school is going on right about now. It kicks off right about at 11 o'clock for grades 6 through 12. The ushers are going to be coming to wait on us for our giving in just a few moments, and we want to say thank you for all of your loving financial support of Harvest Time. Thank you for your faithfulness in the Lord's tithe. The word tithe means a tenth, and the tithe is the first 10% of what the Father has blessed us with. You know, concerning the tithe, it's the only place in the scriptures where God challenges you and me to put him to the test. He says, test me in this. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I won't open up for you the windows of heaven, and I'll pour out such a blessing on you that there won't be room enough to contain it. Isn't that a good promise? Amen. And it goes on from there, you know. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. How many of you want to see that devourer rebuked? Amen. Amen. We also want to thank you for supporting the work of missions here at home and all around the world. We support missionary endeavors in uh, about 50 or, well, so just about 60. I guess somebody will help me before next week with that number, right? All over the world. You can use the uh, envelope that's in your program today to give in a few different ways. You can give by a check made payable to Harvest Time Church. You can give by debit card or by credit card. If you are giving that way, please make sure you provide us with complete card information. If you're giving cash today and you'd like to receive credit for your gifts, please make sure that we know who you are so that we can get you the credit that you need. You can give online anytime when you use our Realm app, or you can just go to our website at htchurch.com. There's a giving link at the top of the homepage, and you can use that link to make a one-time gift or to set up regular automatic giving, and a lot of people are choosing to give that way these days, as you can imagine. Some people like to give by text and instructions as to how how to give by text are on the screens for you. Just before the ushers come to wait on us, I want to remind you we've got life groups of many different kinds meeting all throughout the week. We've got Bible studies, prayer groups. They meet on different days of the week, both here at the church and in other places. And life groups are a great way for you to grow in your faith and to make some new friends in the church. Wednesday evenings, Family Life Night here at Harvest Time. All of our kids and teens programs are up and running at 7 o'clock. We've got something for everybody. And there are also many Bible studies and life groups that are meeting for adults on Wednesday evenings as well. You can still join a group. Search for a group on our Realm app or through the website. 
All right, I saw a very fleeting image there of Pastor Glenn seated atop a tractor. And that reminds us that on Sunday the 30th, the harvest party is coming up and we need your help. We would love to have some of your baking this year. And we're also looking for some people to help with our trunks of treats and set up and tear down and all those things. You can RSVP and let us know how you'd like to help by using the QR code that's in your program. One more thing, I want to remind you that we are working with Op Operation Christmas Child again this year to collect gifts for kids in need. And uh, every year we put together shoe boxes to uh, bless children with gifts at Christmas time. This goes out to about 50 different countries, a wonderful work, great way of introducing people to Jesus at Christmas. Visit the table in the lobby for more info, and you can pick up a few shoe boxes and get ready, you and your family, to fill those shoe boxes with gifts and with love, and you can bring them back to the church over the next few weeks. Going to ask the ushers to come and wait on us now for our giving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Father to bless us and the gifts that we're about to sow into his faithful hands. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the beautiful name of Jesus this morning. We thank you for all of your loving kindness towards us in Christ, Lord. Lord, we declare, we've seen the truth of what your word says, that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And we rejoice, Lord, in all your care and provision for us. Lord, with grateful hearts, we're coming to you now. We return to you the tithe, and we bring you our gifts for the spread of the gospel and our gifts for our building fund. Father, I ask that you would bless each and every giver in the week that's coming up, Lord. Multiply the seed that we're sowing today into your hands. Father, would you use these gifts, Lord, to help us to reach our region and reach the world for the glory of your Son. We pray it all in his name. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give this morning. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be together. We're glad that you're here. Glad that you came to worship the Lord with us. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, turn with us to the letter of Titus, chapter 2. Titus, chapter 2. Going to start reading in the first verse. Want to share with you a short study on self-control. A short study on self-control. Titus chapter 2. While you're finding your way there, a uh, couple quick things for you. Our missions weekend is coming up the first weekend of November. This is when we celebrate the work of God going on all around the world and we participate in it. Uh, many of you know that for a long time we've done on Friday evening of Missions Weekend, we've done an international dinner or an international food tasting event. We thought we'd change it up this year. And rather than eating food, we thought maybe we would send some food to some people who need it. And so... On Saturday morning, the 5th of November, we're going to be packing meals for Ukrainian refugees. Our goal is to pack 36,000 meals. So uh, we're going to provide everything that's needed to pack the meals. We just need your help, your volunteer labor. Uh, we'll be together for maybe two, two and a half hours or so on that Saturday morning. And we hope you'll be part of it. And then ladies, this coming Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, Ruth Ann Garlock is going to be here. She has written several books on prayer. Uh, she has been a, a teacher in Europe in seminary and at Christ for the Nations in Dallas. And ladies, you'll be super, super blessed. Um, several of our ladies' prayer groups have worked through her books 
and we're so delighted that she's going to be with us. So seminar on prayer this coming Saturday morning starting at 9 o'clock. All right, Titus chapter 2. Going to start reading in verse 1. Now I just want to say at the outset that I preached really good in first service and first service didn't appreciate it. So, all right, so... So I hope you're going to appreciate good preaching. <laughs> All right. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Paul writes to his son Timothy, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to healthy doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate. That word temperate means to abstain from wine. Worthy of respect. I want you to look at the next words. If you have a paper Bible, underline them. self Controlled and healthy in faith, love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, to, but to teach what is good. Then they can encourage the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be, there's those words again, say them with me, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, Subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be, there it is again, to be, say it with me, self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be put to a shame because they have nothing bad to say about us. For the grace of God that brings salvation, verse 11, has appeared to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live upright. Here it is again, self-controlled, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Let's share a short study in self-control. So a women's Bible study group was in the New Testament book of James and they came across this scripture, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you might be healed. The group leader decided that they should put that word into action. And so she suggested that they each confess one thing about themselves and pray for one another. Being a good leader, she went first. She said, sisters, pray for me. I'm really struggling with my temper these days. I've been short with my husband. I've been impatient with my kids. I've been aggressive behind the wheel. I've been snippy with strangers. Encouraged by the leader's vulnerability, the second woman said, pray for me, sisters. I've really been struggling with jealousy lately. All my friends have new clothes, and my clothes are out of date. Our, our house needs so much work, I'm embarrassed to even invite our friends over, and everyone take such nice vacations and we can't afford to go anywhere. The third woman's face turned red. She said, pray for me. I, I've been drinking a little too much. I started having a glass of wine every afternoon to take the edge off and I, I kept moving my glass of wine up earlier and earlier in the day and now I just can't seem to get through the day without it. Everyone looked at the fourth woman she was trembling all over and she could barely sit still in her chair. She said, pray for me, sisters. My sin is gossip and I can't wait to get out of here and get busy. <laughs> let's, let's talk about self-control for a few minutes. The residents of the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea had an enormous self-control problem. One of their own national heroes and their poet laureate Epimenides wrote this about his fellow countrymen. Cretans are always liars, 
evil brutes and lazy gluttons. The people of Crete couldn't control their mouths. They couldn't control their runaway emotions. They couldn't control their behavior. Those words evil brutes mean they act like wild animals. They couldn't manage their time. They couldn't control their attitudes. They couldn't control their bodily appetites. Beloved, can I tell you that 2,000 years later, the same words could be rightly said about America. America, we have a self-control crisis. We can't control our anger. We can't control our words. We can't control our appetites. We can't control our attitudes toward authority. And we don't have mastery over our lazy, self-indulgent flesh. Honestly, I worry that we're lacking the self-control that is necessary for a peaceful and a prosperous and a self-perpetuating society. So what is the fix for a self-control crisis? Paul writes about it to his spiritual son, Titus, in chapter 2 of this letter. Let's look together at a short study in self-control. First of all, let's talk about the goal of self-control. On your way in, you received an outline. And if you like, you can watch the screens, listen, fill in the blanks, follow along. If you'd like to have an outline at home, there's a link in the PDF uh, uh, to a PDF file in the chat section of the live stream. Let's talk about the goal of self-control. Jesus said to the 12 disciples, you didn't pick me, I chose you. And I appointed you to bear fruit that remains. Beloved, can I tell you that those words are still true for the church. Jesus picked us, we didn't pick him. And his purpose for us is that we would perpetually produce good fruit. His purpose for us is that we have an enduring positive influence in God's world and lead people to Christ. In these first few verses of Titus chapter 2, I I see some qualities of churches that remain. What are some qualities of churches that have vibrant staying power? Churches that remain fruitful have a strong family atmosphere. They feel like a family. You know, Jesus' own circle of followers felt very much like a family. The early church met primarily in homes. Their gatherings were like a family meal, like a family holiday celebration. Churches that remain fruitful are multi-generational. They're made up of grandparents and parents, children and grandchildren, even great-grandchildren, aunties and uncles. Listen, churches that are made up of only senior adults aren't going to last very long. And churches that are made up of only young adults don't have stability. They don't have staying power. We have seen them come and we have seen them go. But listen, this is a good line. It's even tweetable, Pastor Nick. When generations work together, churches last for generations. Churches that remain fruitful are diverse. They're multiracial, multi-ethnic. They are socially and economically diverse. From the day of Pentecost onward, that is what the church has always been. The church in Jerusalem was diverse, and everywhere the church spread in the world, it was diverse. Churches that remain fruitful highly value the nuclear father, family. Father, mother, And children, I mean a biological male father, a biological female mother, and boys and girls. Churches that that remain fruitful, they value nuclear families and, and they help nuclear families get healthier and healthier. Mature fathers model Christian maturity for young men and mature mothers do the same for young women. Churches that remain are where self-control is modeled and mentored. 
What does self-control look like in different groups in God's family? For mature men, maybe it means fighting the tendency towards negativity and peevishness and impatience. How many of you have ever seen the iconic movie, The Godfather? There's a scene in that movie where Vito Corleone is passing on the baton to his son, Michael. And the godfather says, I like to drink wine more than I used to. Anyway, I'm drinking more. When I was young, I foolishly believed that life gets easier as one gets older. I did. Truly, I, I, I thought, you know, there's less struggle for survival. There's less competition. There's less pressure than when one is young. But I've discovered that, in fact, life does not get easier. Sure, there are many things that do become settled in your life. But there's also an accumulation of a lot of pain. And some days your body just plain doesn't feel so good. There's a process of life review that happens. Did I do my best? Did I make my life count? Like Vito Corleone, a lot of men reach for something to dull that pain. But Paul tells his son and the Lord Titus, there are no answers in a bottle. Teach the older men to be temperate. And it's no help if you're reaching for the bottle. It's no help for the young men that are coming up behind you looking for guidance and looking for encouragement. Instead of self-medicating, we need to learn how to become self-controlled with the help of the Holy Spirit. In order to fight negativity and peevishness and impatience, Paul tells mature men to lean into a few things. First of all, he says, lean into faith. Trust God with the outcomes of your life. Trust God with your past. Trust him with your present. Trust him with your future. Trust him with your health. Trust him with your financial security. Trust him with your family. Trust him with the future generations. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen in 2040. God is fully in control and he knows what he's doing. He's got it. Paul also tells older men to lean into love. Don't give up on people. God hasn't given up on humanity. Neither should we. Don't stop opening your heart to people. Don't stop extending yourself to them. Don't stop reaching out a helping hand, especially to younger men. Be selfless with your time. My brothers, I love you, but nowhere has God ever given us the permission to just relax and shirk responsibility. Lean into endurance. Don't quit living your life with purpose. Don't Worry about what you can no longer do. Concentrate on what you can do. And whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. What does self-control look like in God's family for mature women? Perhaps it means fighting the tendency towards comparison and criticism and complaining. Older women share the same challenges as older men. They, too, fight the temptation to self-medicate. And as they think back over their lives, one trap to avoid is comparing themselves with young women and criticizing the younger women. Now, Justice is going to have to cut this part of the sermon from the rebroadcast because my mother watches the rebroadcast uh, a few days after Sunday and she can't hear this part, but you can I love my mom with my whole heart. I loved my mother-in-law with my whole heart. But both of them had a way of letting us know on occasion that they didn't necessarily approve with our parenting practices. <laughs> I never let my kids do this. I never let my kids do that. As it's like they have selective. Anybody have parents with selective memories? 
as if we were perfect angels. I was there. We were not perfect angels. Rather than criticizing or complaining about the younger generations, Paul says to the mature women, get involved. Take a young wife, take a young mom under your wing, invite her for coffee, build a friendship, listen to her, pray with her, and pray for her. When we started out on our journey in parenting, we were advised that when your kids are small, it's physically exhausting, but when your kids grow up, it becomes mentally exhausting. Truer words were never spoken. And if you've been there yourself, you can encourage a, a, a young mom with an empathetic ear and even more than that, a prophetic ear. You can be used by the Holy Spirit to bring an encouraging word at the moment she needs it the most. This is good preaching right here. It's a little bit of cornbread, I know, but it's good preaching. What does self-control look like in God's family for young women? Maybe it means fighting the tendency towards discontentment and insignificance. As if keeping up with the Joneses and chasing the American dream weren't bad enough already, along came social media. So now we can compare our ordinary days or our worst days against everyone else's highlight reels. Everyone seems to be enjoying a better life than me. Especially for young women, there can be a stretch of years where the demands of home life take precedence over other goals and over other ambitions, and they make personal sacrifices for the sake of the family. I was a pretty good seminary student, I was, but Denise was a brilliant seminary student. When we finished our Master of Divinity program, we were both offered a full free ride to earn PhD degrees. Denise was the real talent. I was just, you know, they, had, they included me because they had to. <laughs> I'm not sure I really have the academic chops for a PhD, but, but Denise definitely does. But it's an opportunity she sacrificed so that we could answer God's call to come here to Greenwich. A few years ago, I was offered a full free ride scholarship to do a doctor of ministry program, but we were in the middle of building this sanctuary and it was out of the question. And then the following year, Denise and I both were offered full free ride scholarships to do a doctor of ministry program, but the needs of our kids at that stage just made it absolutely impossible. Listen, we have zero regrets, zero, for any of the sacrifices that we've made for our church or for our family, but I will tell you they have been sacrifices. Maybe an opportunity to study will come again, maybe it won't, but Denise chose to lean into God's purposes for our family, and I'm so thankful that she did. What does self-control look like in God's family for young men Maybe it means fighting the tendency towards ambition and restlessness and rambunctiousness. To the Christians in Corinth, St. Paul wrote, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I reasoned like a child, I thought like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For young men, self-control means taking your life seriously rather than giving your young years to the cause of wine, women, and song, become purposeful about becoming a man of God and doing good things with your life. <laughs> Beloved, <laughs> listen to me. Nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in the Bible does it give young men permission to live the first three decades of their lives for themselves. And then start to think about becoming a mature Christian man. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. <laughs> Titus started following Christ as a teenager. And by the time he was 30, he became a key player in a movement that changed the course 
of all of human history. I don't believe that God is quite done with his world yet. I don't believe that God is quite done with America yet. I believe that God still has a few more tricks up his sleeve. I believe that God still has a few more revivals to come. And I believe that there are history changers in this room. Young women and especially young men get excited about God's purpose for your life and get serious about pursuing it. Time to stop playing games. What does self-control look like in God's family? I like the way one writer put it, for all of us, it means to act our age, biblically speaking. It means to enjoy being the age that we are and enjoy contributing to God's family in ways that are age appropriate. A short study on self-control. You're doing all right? All right, now we get to the good part. Now we get to Jesus. The goal of self-control. Let's talk now about the grace of self-control. The grace of self-control. How do we get self-control? How do we gain mastery over our minds, over our emotions, over our bodies? From St. Paul's letters, we know what does not work. Legalism does not work. Since the days of Moses, rule keeping has never worked and it never will. Asceticism doesn't work. I left that one blank for you. I should have spelled it out to be kind. Asceticism, A-S-C-E-T, asceticism. Denying ourselves the good things that God has provided for our enjoyment and health and pleasure, it doesn't work. It only stokes the fire of desire. Even having a description of self-control, like we have here in Titus 2, on its own, it's not particularly helpful. It only reminds us of how far away we are from the mark. So what is the answer? Well, have listen to me. Self-control comes through Jesus Christ. God's solution to our human self-control crisis is grace. St. Paul says the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That word appeared is the word epiphany. It, it means a sunrise on a dark horizon. All of a sudden, the sun comes bursting into the darkness. At just the right moment in human history, Jesus, the light of the world, came onto the human stage. In his earthly life and ministry, Jesus was the greatest manifestation of grace and love ever witnessed by mankind. Jesus was grace personified. He was God's goodness personified, God's kindness, God's mercy, God's undeserved favor extended toward us. Jesus was all of those things personified and grace personified. Jesus gave himself for us. His whole life was perfectly dedicated to serving others. He was self control personified his thoughts his emotions his words his behavior completely surrendered to his heavenly father Jesus said I only say what I hear my father saying I only do what my father shows me to do ultimately Jesus gave up his life on the cross on our behalf his death was a voluntary substitutionary sacrifice he died as our representative before God he took upon himself the punishment that our sins deserved since 33 AD knowledge of Jesus death has been widespread around the entire world testifying before King Agrippa 20 years after the crucifixion, St. Paul said, King, I know you're familiar. I know you know what I'm talking about because what Jesus did wasn't done in a corner. For a few years now, I've been compiling thoughts about why it had to be a cross specifically that Jesus died upon. 
Before the foundation of the world, before God said, let there be light, God prescribed that Jesus must die on a cross. Why? Maybe I'll get to preach that to you someday, but, but let me give you just one little bite. Crucifixion was absolutely the most public way that anyone could be ex executed. By sunset on Good Friday, all of Jerusalem and all of the suburbs of Jerusalem knew that Jesus of Nazareth had died that day on a Roman cross. On Easter Sunday morning, when two of Jesus' disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, getting out of Dodge, they were incredulous that the stranger they were talking to, who was Jesus, risen from the dead, though they didn't recognize him, they were incredulous that this stranger seemed to be ignorant about the crucifixion. They said, where on earth have you been for the last three days? Within a few decades, the news of Jesus crucifixion reverberated throughout the entire civilized world. Everyone heard about these crazy Jewish fishermen who turned the whole world upside down with the message of a crucified Savior. This graffiti was found near Caesar's palace in Rome. It dates to the first century AD. It depicts Jesus dying on a cross with a donkey's head. It's meant as an ultimate insult. And the inscription reads in Greek, Alexa Minos worships his God. In other words, only a donkey would worship a crucified savior. What kind of God is that? Nearby, there's another inscription that seems to be a rebuttal as graffiti so goes. Alexa Minos is faithful. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So how exactly then does Christ's coming, how does his sacrificial death help my self-control crisis? How does that 2,000-year-old event, how does it help me now? Well, first of all, his death sets us free from the grip of sin. And his death purifies us from sin. That word redeemed, it means to purchase freedom for slaves or for prisoners of war. On the cross, Jesus paid the ransom price for our freedom. St. Paul says sin no longer has dominion over you. Without Christ, we are doomed to sin. We can't help but to sin, but Christ sets us free not to sin. When we believe on him, he purifies us from sin. He takes away our memory of sin. He takes away our taste for sin. He takes away whatever it is in our innermost being that causes us to keep going back to sin again and again and again. Somebody received the word of God. He breaks the power of addiction over our lives. There is no addiction more powerful than Jesus. There is no addiction more powerful than his name. There is no addiction more powerful than the blood of Jesus where sin is plentiful and abundant grace is even more plentiful and abundant. Sin can never outmeasure His grace. And then His grace trains us to say yes and no. Beloved, listen to me. Somebody hear this today. Grace is not a license to just go do whatever we want to do because we know God will forgive us. Grace is inner strength from God to say no to the things that we ought not to do. Grace is inner strength from God to control our bodily appetites, to manage our emotions, to rein in our thought life 
And grace enables us to say yes to the right things. Grace makes us disciplined. Grace makes us wise. Grace makes us good decision makers. Grace makes us want to do what is right. I don't want to wrong others. I want to do right by others. And grace makes us reverent. I don't want to grieve the heart of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to live to please him. A short study on self-control, the goal of self-control, the grace of self-control. Finally this, let's talk fast about the glory of self-control. Worship team, you can help me. The glory of self-control. Everybody listen, listen, listen. There's one more way that grace helps us in our self-control crisis. Grace inspires hopeful anticipation inside of us. God put on a body of human flesh. He burst onto the world stage in the person of Jesus Christ. He gave his life on the cross to redeem us. He rose again on the third day and he ascended back to the Father. But Jesus is coming back again. When he appears for the second time, it will not be like the first time. Then he slipped into the world quietly. He was born into abject poverty. He was welcomed by lowly shepherds. Jesus arrived in anonymity. He lived his life in humility. He ministered in mercy and he died in ignominy, dying on a terrorist cross. His own disciples were too defeated to even bury his body. But when Jesus comes again, it will be in a full-on manifestation of God's glory. When Jesus comes again, every eye will behold him and all the nations of the earth will mourn because of him. They will look on the one that they pierced and they will grieve bitterly. Jesus' first appearance was an act of grace. But his second appearance will be an act of glory. For those who have rejected Jesus, that will be a terrible day indeed. But for those of us who have been chosen in him, a wonderful moment of supernatural transformation is going to occur. A process is going to be completed in us whereby the beautiful fruit of self-control becomes our permanent state of being. Our forever disposition will be pure and eager to do what is good. When we see Jesus in his glory in a way that I cannot fully describe to you, his glory will become our glory. In some way, he will share a portion of his own glory with us. Now, that doesn't mean we become God or we become part of God. But in the same way that the sun illuminates the moon, his glory will light us up. St. Paul wrote to the Colossians, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. St. John said, it has not yet appeared. The world has never seen. Nothing in creation has ever seen what we are about to become. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall become like him. For we shall see him as he is. That's good preaching right there. John, I'm glad to see you this morning. God bless you. We've been praying for you all week, John. I'm glad you're here. Okay, that's pretty cool, but how does that help me? How how does that help me with self-control right now? Right now, we live in the time between his two appearances. We look back on his appearance in grace, and we live in that grace, and we look forward to his appearance in glory, and the anticipation of that helps us to stay in the rails now. Let's finish with this and see if it connects. Where are my Italian friends? Where are all my Italian friends? All right, you're going to like this one. 
So I grew up in a, in a German, Irish, thoroughly Madagon family. On holidays, my grandmothers and my mom and my aunts, they would cook for like eight hours. And then we'd sit down at the table and in 45 minutes we would inhale everything and dinner was over. And then it would take three hours to clean the dishes afterwards. Anybody else Madagon here? Anybody, anybody, any other Madagons? All right, you know what I'm talking about. First time I ever had an authentic Italian holiday dinner was here at harvest time. These are our friends, Joe and Chicky Scopoletti. Chicky was our bookkeeper for 35 years here at Harvest Time Church. Joe is a retired IBM executive. When we were building our first building, he donated two years of his time to be our project man manager, our owner's representative. I'm sure they're watching this morning from South Carolina. Everybody give a wave to, to Joe and Chicky. Just give a wave to them. So our first... New Year's, Chick, do you remember? It was New Year's Day, 1997. Chicky invited us over for, for New Year's Day dinner. Dinner was set for 2 p.m. We had a service that night at harvest time that went till after midnight. We slept in a little bit late, and we didn't eat anything all day in anticipation of dinner. Finally, at about 1 o'clock, I couldn't take it anymore, and I ate a, a bowl of cold cereal. Then he said to me, what are you doing? It's, it's time to go. It's time to leave and go over to Joe and Chickie's. I said, I, 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 I got to have something. I got to eat. And I'm thinking like 45 minutes at the table. When Chickie said, come hungry, I should have taken the hint. Never before in my life have I ever seen so much food come out of a kitchen. And all of it was absolutely sensational. Started with the antipasto with breads and cheeses and olives and stuffed peppers and stuffed artichokes and suprasad and, and pickled vegetables. After the antipas came the pasta course. Best menagot I ever had. I seriously, everybody got up to leave the table and I thought dinner was over. No, we were just taking a walk. We, we took a walk around the block a couple times and came back and sat down at the table and then came the meat courses dishes and dishes of meats and fishes. And then it was salad somewhere along the line. I don't know where the fennel came out, Pastor Nick, but somewhere along the line, fennel came out to help with digestion. It didn't help. We got up, we took another walk. When we got back, it was Venetian hour. Cannolis and desserts on tears. I, there was so much dessert on the table, I thought it was going to collapse under the weight of all. No lie, no lie. We started dinner at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. At 10 o'clock at night, we were still sitting around the table, and I never regretted eating a bowl of cold cereal more in my life. And I never again ate a bowl of cold cereal before going to dinner at Chicky Scopoletti's. How does the, the hope uh, of his coming in glory, how does that help me to, to live a self-controlled life now? Well, it, it, it inspires me. It, it awakens anticipation inside of me that what is coming is something amazingly good and even the best pleasures that the world has to offer by comparison is just a bowl of cold cereal. The hope, of, the hope of his coming, it inspires me to hold on, to stay within the rails, to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly life because Jesus is coming. And when he comes, it's going to be good. It's going to be real good. <laughs> Beloved, there's a banquet that is ready for you and for me. The antipast is already on the dishes. The pasta water is boiling. The gravy is bubbling in the pot. The roast is in the oven. The fennel has been washed and it's been cut. It's ready to serve. It's time to get our coats on. It's time to get ready to go. It's almost two o'clock. It's almost dinner time.
For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come on, give him a big hand in this place today. Oh, come on, let's give him a big hand in this place today. Holy Spirit's here. We love you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. Come on, up in heaven, they sing worthy, 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 worthy is the Lamb. We're going to sing that together. Worthy, worthy, worthy are you, Jesus. I want you to lift up your faces, lift up your voices, lift up your hands. Come on, worthy is your name, Jesus. Sing it out. Let's take the roof off of this church today. Let's tell him he's worthy of all praise. Come on, let's do it. Give him one more good praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Stay, stay with us for just a moment, if you would, because we're going we're gonna to bless our friends, Raphael and Lara, in just one moment. But I need somebody to receive the word of the Lord today. Sin shall not have dominion over you. said in your head, I can't get free. I can't get free. I can't get free. I can't get free. Beloved, where sin has abounded, grace much more abounds. You can be free. You can be free. You shall be free. You are free. You are free. You are free. 
Come on, if you're willing, put your hand over your heart. I want to pray for you. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would give your people grace to comprehend grace. God, give them grace to understand the unsearchable riches. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come against addiction and we break the power of addiction. Lord, we break the power of alcohol addiction, nicotine addiction, drug addiction, pornography addiction, social media addiction, shopping addiction. In Jesus' name. Christ has redeemed you. He's purchased you. He's purified you. And he's perfecting you. Sin does not have dominion over you. Come on, I want you to just put your hand on your heart. And just say, I receive it all, Jesus. I receive it all. I receive it all. Everything bought on Calvary. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. I receive it, Jesus. I receive you, Jesus. Father, bless your people in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you, everyone. Stay, stay right where you are for, for just a moment, if you would, please. If, if you'd remain standing for just a moment. I want to welcome, this is Professor Glauco Lima. Glauco teaches worship and he teaches music at uh, Alliance University. It used to be Nyack College just across the river. They moved to Manhattan, got fancy and changed their name. But uh, Professor Lima, thank you for being with us today. You have blessed us. So thank you so much. <clears throat> and I want to ask our friends Raphael and Lara D'Souza if they would come with Isabella and Melissa. I think... Uh, Raphael's mom, Lucia, is here. Lucia, would you come? And Lara's aunt, is it Lida or Leda? Leda, Leda. The girls didn't want to come. All right, that's good. That's good. So actually, uh, Melly went and played a little piano solo in the first service. So we want to just bless Raphael, Raphael and Lara for um, a new ministry role in our church family. They came to me a few months ago when we were in transition and they said, Pastor, we're offering ourselves to come and take the creative team, worship and production, live stream and everything and, and to just pastor and shepherd that team. They offered themselves as volunteers to our church family. So Raphael grew up in a pastor's home in Brazil in his college years. He moved here to Connecticut. Um, his dad and mom pastor a church in Danbury, a Brazilian congregation. And thank you for being with us today, Pastor. So uh, Raphael's dad is on duty. He's preaching. So, But we're so glad that you're here. Lara grew up here in Greenwich. Her dad pastored a Brazilian congregation in Stamford. And in 2012, they came and merged with Harvest Time. And uh, Pastor Helio and Helena are watching from Brazil. It's time to come home, Pastor Helio. We need you over here. It's time to come home. Pastor, I just got choked up by the Holy Spirit with that, so receive the word from the Lord. But uh, Raphael has a bachelor's degree in theology, and Lara studied psychology. Actually, I always get nervous around people. I didn't know it was in psychology. I always get nervous when I find out I'm in the presence of a psych major because I wonder if they're shrinking me or not. <laughs> but uh, I had approached Raphael and Lara a few years back and asked them when we were looking for a youth pastor if they would pray about coming on our team and serving as our youth pastors. And it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right position, but we thank God that he's just raised them up for such a time as this. They have a heart to serve our family and, and to serve the Lord. They have their hands full, so I need you to pray for them. Raphael has a business in Stanford. Lara is an HR executive. Uh, 
Um, and so they've got two beautiful little girls, so they've got a lot on their plate. But, you know, St. Paul said, I worked harder than everybody else, but it wasn't me. God gave me grace to do it. And so that's exactly what we're praying. Pastor Nick and all of our pastors, any of our board members that are here in this service, um, please feel welcome to come join us on the platform. And we're going to lay our hands and bless Raphael and Lara. I wanted to just bring it. Now listen, I went so long in the last, I went so long in the last service that there was no time to eat cupcakes downstairs, which means that we have cups, cupcakes for the first service and the second service. So as soon as we say amen, you all need to go downstairs and eat a cupcake, all right? So I, I promise it won't spoil Jesus' com second coming banquet if you eat a cupcake. But go down and greet them afterwards. But Raphael, bring a greeting. Wow, it's a, it's an honor to be here. Um, as Pastor said, we've been we've been coming and serving at Harvest Time for the past ten years now, and uh, we we just just wanted to do more. Uh, as I said uh, a while back, we we talked about uh, taking care of the, the youth, but for some reason it wasn't the time we we didn't have peace about it. But this time. Um, God just gave us that peace to serve in a different capacity. And uh, we see a lot of familiar faces, family, friends, people that have been walking with us for uh, quite a few years now. Glauco is, uh, is one of them. Um, everything that we do in the house of God, uh, anywhere, we need help, right? And as soon as you are called to do something that has a lot of responsibility into it, it's a big responsibility. So then we start thinking about people we can trust, people that are godly, people that have the calling of God on their lives to come and walk along with us. And we have a lot of people here that they've been praying with us. My, my, my dad's not here, but my mom, uh, she was the one that kind of pushed me to do uh, theology in school. At the time, we were just fresh in, here in America, a year, two years here. And she said, no, you're going to go study theology. I'm like, okay. All right. yes, the, mom. Okay, mom. Right? And you see, like, years after, years go by, and then you see God moving pieces, moving people, closing doors, opening doors. And uh, at the right time, at his time, there's just sometimes you can't say no. You just have to bow down and say, Lord, it's your time. Yes. So we're just so thankful for everybody, everybody that you're here, that you came to, to say hello, to support us. We love you. Uh, we're here to serve you. And uh, we can't wait. We can't wait to see what God is going to do in this next chap chapter of our lives and our church lives. Thank you very much. It's such an honor to be able to serve this team. Um, the creative team includes worship, production, and the visuals around um, the building. And so I just want to say thank you to all of you that have come around us already and said, how can we help? We love each and every one of you. And um, Pastor, I was uh, on my drive here. I was just thinking about, you know, our walk and our journey in this house. And I remembered that when we were building phase two, the verse that we put in, um, in the foundation of the church, and we wrote, Lord, use us how you will in this house. So we surrender to him, and just we welcome your prayers. <laughs> Love you, church. Stretch, stretch your hands forward. We're going to bless Pastor Raphael and Lara. And then if any, anybody on the platform has a word for them, we're going to invite you to share. Raphael, we anoint you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lara, we anoint you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for our precious friends, our co-laborers in the gospel, our brother and our sister. Thank you for their two beautiful girls. Thank you for this family. Lord, thank you that while they were still being formed, knit together in their mother's wombs, Lord, you set your love on them. And Father, you called them, Lord, for such a time as this. Father, we pray that the anointing of heaven 
would rest mightily upon them, oh God. Lord, we bring you our best, but our best, Lord, is, is nothing. But Father, when your anointing blows on it, God, it moves mountains. It changes cultures. It brings revival. Father, I just pray that you would anoint them. I pray that you'd give them great grace, Lord, grace to just handle the responsibilities of work and family and ministry. Lord, I pray that it would look easy from the outside in, Lord, because your grace is enabling all of it. Father, give them songs. Give them new songs. Lord, with this team, give them new songs for a new day. Lord, give them new songs for a new season. Lord, not just for harvest time, but for your church with a capital C across America. Lord, I pray that you'd give them grace to build something unique here. Lord, something that we haven't seen before as a church. And Lord, something that's just a model for other places. Father, thank you for our friends. Bless them with good health. Protect them, oh God. Lord, I pray that as they look after the business of your family, you would look after their family. Lord, I pray everything they touch would prosper, bring a good result and a good return. And Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. All right, can, can you hold for one more minute? There's cupcakes downstairs. You know, you can hold out because something good is coming. I just want to see if anybody has any words from the Lord. Bless you, friends. Just, um, I, I had shared in the first service that the Lord was giving you arrows to destroy the enemy and disarm opponents, which were um, the anointing and kindness and truth. But, but there was more. And the Lord said that because you've been going to him, and saying, Lord, the only way that this will work, the only way that there will be breakthrough is through your anointing. The Lord says, I'm going to give you a special grace in fasting and prayer and in prophetic wisdom that God's going to give you to be able to untangle difficult situations and to make the progress that he wants to give you. Uh, while Pastor Glenn was praying, the Lord showed me this huge um, shepherd's staff between the two of you. And uh, larger than one person can navigate. And I think that the Holy Spirit just wants you to know that together there is great work and great leadership for you to do. You ready to hear it again? <laughs> well, I... I was on for a surprise. I was literally praying that Pastor Helio and Helena were here. That was so when Pastor Glenn, you know, said that. So I give them my love and we need them here. Amen. Um, yes, earlier I shared how the Lord, when I was praying for Raphael and Lara, this week the Lord took me to Esther uh, chapter four. But the word that I heard was, you know, and when Raphael said, we have said yes to his calling, that really resonated with me because the word that I heard was, do not miss this opportunity. It is not another opportunity. It is the opportunity. And Esther determined in her heart, I am going to see the king, although it is against the law, so you will be facing challenges. If I perish, I perish. But if she had not determined that in her heart, we wouldn't be here. It is that serious. Amen. And then the Lord took me to Luke chapter 2, when Mary and Joseph lost Jesus during Passover. And after three days, they go back to the temple. And they, asked, they found him and they asked him, why have you done that, this to us? And he said, I must be about my father's business. And the kingdom of God, it is the business. And it is the only what we do, what you will do in his kingdom will have eternal value. Nothing else in the world, but the work in God's kingdom is the only thing that has eternal value 
We love you. Welcome. And do not miss the opportunity. So what Pastor Ruth was just praying was complete confirmation because I, I was feeling like the Holy Spirit just saying that, you know, he was, um, you know, who's going to look after my children? And, you know, when, when Christ was off and away from his parents, it's just like, because he, he was about his father's business. So while you're about your father's business in heaven, he's going to be looking after your little ones and taking care of them and protecting them and leading them and building them up. So we thank you, Lord, for protecting their children, for raising them up in the house, Lord God, and just blessing them as they sow into this house, Lord God. You sow into their children's lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, th I, thank, I thank the Holy Spirit that there's no confusion. So this is just further confirmation. Raphael, when you shared with me your heart to want to minister to the worship team, you and I know you can't do it with an, an empty tank when it's on E. You need it to be at full and to operate at a full capacity. So I pray that and trust that God will give you a full capacity, a new anointing, a fresh anointing to be able to undertake that task. We trust that God will fulfill that. I was not going to say anything because I was not prepared for this. I didn't know I was going to come up. But I'm sitting here and I'm burning up. And all I can feel, and the Lord says to you both, be ready to unleash the fire of the Spirit that's going to be coming down through your, through your worship. Allow Him to use you in a way that you've never been used before to bring the supernatural into the natural. That these altars will be filled with worshipers, with all of you who are going to be worshiping the Lord on your knees before the Lord because the presence of God is going to be so strong. Be ready, be ready, be ready. Come on, let's give the Lord one more great big praise. Let Pastor Raphael and Lara know how much we love them. God bless you, everybody. Go downstairs, greet Raphael and Lara. Just give them your love. Have a great week in Jesus. God be with you.